a kind of a, a quick review on this, okay? So a couple of things I want to remind you of is these things, because if you've been out of math for a long time, you may have forgotten. Anytime you have something to the zero power, that's equal to one. Anytime you have negative exponents, those end up going to decimals like this. A lot of times students don't understand how human beings figured out what negative exponents are. There was a time we had no clue. Most people a thousand years ago had no clue what negative exponents meant, okay? But here's one way that we kind of figure this out. This makes a nice pattern. So you already know the positive exponents are just 10, 100, 1,000, like that. Well, it just goes down, okay? What we're doing on that is, see, what you're doing is you're dividing. So if you do 1,000 divided by 100, you get 10. So the next one has to be 10 divided by 10 to get 1. Then it's 1 divided by 10, 1 divided by 100, and so forth. So it makes a nice pattern. I mean, that's kind of what we looked at with negative exponents and zero. That's one way that we sort of discovered what that it made sense, okay? So what you want to make sure you remember how to do is what the zero exponent is and that negative exponent's how they're treated. So if you had 10 to the negative 5, that's 1 over 10 to the fifth, okay? So it becomes a very small number, okay? I thought this was cool. I saw this on the internet. You could make a Valentine's card out of this thing. Woo-hoo, okay? It makes a little heart, okay? Like that. So what you have on this, if you just kind of put those, uh, put the numbers together in exponents, they form that pattern, okay? Right? So we're going to do a real quick review. I, I put this up here mostly just for, for your purpose, okay? If you're going to study science and everything, then these are the kind of things you show up. So like your negative exponents show up in tiny things like that. And this, of course, goes along with computers. So right now, I think like a, a personal computers right now, like some of the Macs and stuff, have like one or two terabytes of memory, right? Okay. When I first started teaching, about the biggest you would get was kilobytes. Of, and that's, that's only been within 25 years. It's changed that much. So what will happen next, I guess, I don't know when, but your com personal computers are going to start having petabyte memory next, then exabyte memory and so forth. The Internet already has exabytes of memory out there. So personal computers are going to get kind of go like that. Speed has been the same way. I think right now, I don't know, I, we use like nanoseconds, picoseconds, femto, addo, just gets faster and faster. So you'll kind of see on the spectrum, memory gets bigger and speed gets smaller. Okay, so that's a good way to help you think of how positive and negative exponents work. That's the reason I like to show that to you. Okay, uh, that website, I was going to show you that because it's pretty cool, but I'll, I, I might put that on Canvas so you can look at that. What I want to have you do is go to page three, and we're going to do a very, very fast <coughs> review of exponents because a lot of times students need a review of exponents because if you don't know how exponent rules work, then you won't understand logarithms at all. Okay, so I'm going to do a real fast review on this. So you should already know that anytime you have any number to the first power, it's itself. Okay, we just reviewed that if you have a zero exponent, if you had something like three to the zero, that's equal to one. Okay, we have the addition property. We have done this this semester. So just as a quick review, if you had x to the third times x to the second, you add the exponents to get x to the fifth. Okay, the reason for that, I've shown you before, is x to the third is 3x's multiplied. x to the second is 2x's multiplied, so you have a total of 5. That's why that uh, works the way it does. It's just a shortcut for counting. That's what that is. We've also looked at this before. So if you had something like x to the fourth to the third, okay, that's x to the twelfth because you multiply your exponents. The mathematical meaning of this problem is this. It means you have x to the fourth, but you have that multiplied out three times. Okay, that's why this problem works the way it does. And then the rest of this, you don't need to write this down, but I just want to show you that if you wrote this out the long way, I would write that out 12 times, right? So if you understand how these rules work, you have a much better chance of remembering them when you need to remember them. Okay, so that's what how that works. Okay, this one uh, we've seen a little bit too. So if you had something like, uh, say you had like x times y times z, and the whole thing was to the 100th power, it just means that every individual part is raised to that power. 
So this would be the same as x to the 100th, y to the 100th, z to the 100th, like that. So you want to basically remember how these basic rules go. Okay. The, the next two, we've seen this too. So if you had something like x to the 5th over x to the 3rd, what you do is you subtract the top exponent minus the bottom exponent. Whoops, that's a 3. So you get x squared, like that. Again, the reason, and I did talk about this way back at the beginning of the semester, is x to the fifth is 5x's, x to the third is 3x's. What happens is three sets cancel, leaving you x squared like that. Okay. So actually, I, if I remember right, I think it was Isaac Newton who's the first person to really figure out what a negative exponent is. And Isaac Newton is one of the people who, is, who developed calculus. And this is what he thought about. Uh, if you had something like x to the third over x to the fifth, if you subtract that exponent, you get x to the negative 3. So what he realized by that is a negative exponent, what it really means is it just means this. It means that when you cancel out, the x's are left in the bottom. Okay, that's what he realized, that he realized that you would subtract exponents like you would in this property, but that would, is kind of the motivation where we began to figure out what a negative exponent is. That's where that comes from. Okay, now this, uh, you'll do this pretty frequently. So what I was showing you, if you had something like x to the negative fifth, you just write that as 1 over x to the fifth. Okay, that's how that works. If you had this backwards, if you had like 1 over x to the negative six, then you bring that to the top so you get x to the six. Okay, now that's a real fast overview of exponents. Okay, if you've got a pretty good foundation for this, That'll help you when you study logarithms, because logarithms are all about exponents. Okay, that's the idea. So I usually like to just give a very, very quick review of that, because you, usually you need to kind of review that. Okay, so on this next page, we're going to look at the graphs of exponential functions. So what we're going to be looking at is functions that look like this. Okay, so we're going to have like f of x, a is just some number that's positive to the x power. So there's a couple of things in here. An exponential function is just going to be some positive number to the x power like that. So we're going to go through and we're going to do a graph on this to get the idea. And then we'll kind of do the transformations and stuff like this. The reason that a can't be 1 is because if a was 1, you'd have 1 to the x. What is 1 to any power? It's 1. And if you graphed y equals 1, it would be a line. Okay, so whenever a is equal to 1, you don't have an exponential function. You have a line. Okay, so that's the idea behind that. The domain is all real numbers. That just means that an exponent can be any number. Exponents can be negative. They can be zero. They can be positive. They can be decimals. They can be square roots. They can be anything. So basically, all real numbers is what you would have. Okay, we're going to go ahead and we're going to crunch out a couple of graphs to start with. So we're going to come up with the graph of, what, of f of x equals 2 to the x. So I said that x can be anything. Well, let's keep it simple. Let's start with 0. Let's go to 1. Let's go to 2. Go to 3. Negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. Let's don't do any decimals. We don't need to. We just need to use those numbers right there. Okay, so when we put this together, we'd have 2 to the 0, which is 1. 2 to the 1st was 2. 2 to the 2nd is 4. 2 to the 3rd is 8, and so forth like that. So what you can see what's happening on this exponential function is this. Now, you can predict what will happen next. Aren't these things just doubling each time? So it'd be 16, 32, 64, and so forth. That's because that base is 2. If that base was 3, then they would go 3, 9, they would just triple each time, 27, 81, and so forth like that. Okay, when you get over here now, this is where you get into your negative exponents. So 2 to the negative 1, just write it as 1 half. If you have 2 to the negative 2, just write that as 1 fourth because that's 1 over 2 to the second, so it's 1 fourth. Okay, then the next one would be what? 1 eighth. Okay, so that's how that works. So what's happening on that is over here, the denominator is doubling while the numerator stays the same. So what's going to happen on this graph if you begin to put this together then? Okay, let's just mainly go out to, to 3 and out to negative 3 like that. And let's make our y-axis go up to 8, and that's good enough. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 
Okay, if you plot your points, you'd have 0, 1, so you do have an x-intercept. You have 1, 2, then you have 2, 4, and then um, 3, and then 8. So, the, so basically the curve does that, and it gets really steep really fast. Okay, so it just goes to infinity. And what happens here is these numbers just get close to 0. I mean, you don't have to plot those, but the idea is as you go out further that way, aren't you just getting close to 0? Because eventually you'd have 1 over infinity, right? So you'd be going to 0 like that. So that's basically how that graph goes is like that. Okay, we're not going to put these in the calculator, not most of them. So basically, in the calculator, you just have to put 2 to the x and put it in. I'm not going to bother doing that, though. Does this equation look, does it look like it has a horizontal asymptote? Does it level off? Yeah, it levels off at what value? Zero. Okay, so the, actually the horizontal asymptote would be y equals zero. See, y equals zero is the x-axis. So what you end up having is, yeah, you actually have a horizontal asymptote going through like that. So that's how an exponential curve goes, is it looks like that. Okay, everything exponentiates, gets bigger fast. Okay, now let's go through and let's do this one. Now we're going to do one just kind of simple thing with this one. We've already got our graph. So what is that negative going to do to this graph? It's going to reflect it. It's going to make all the y's go to opposites. Okay, so what's going to happen on this? I want you to just use the same values. Okay, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. And then what you want to do is, well, all of those things are going to go to opposites. Because what that's really doing is just making multiplying that by negative 1. What's really happening is this is negative 1 times 2 to the x. That's what that negative means. So if you take these values, you're going to have negative 1 eighth, negative 1 fourth, negative 1 half, negative 1, negative 2, negative 4, negative 8, like that. So that's a reflection. We've already learned how that those transformations work. So just put, go ahead and let's draw a rough graph on this going out to 3, and then to negative 3, and then let's go down to negative 8. Everything's below the x-axis this time. Okay, like that. So then if you plot these points, we would have, I'm going to start here with 3, negative 8, uh, 2, negative 4, and then 1, negative 2, and then we have 0, negative 1. So the graph's going to go like that. And then it's just basically, again, going to approach the x-axis like that. So it's a reflection of the first one. And uh, this one, you just put in the calculator negative 2 to the x. It has exactly the same horizontal asymptote like that. Okay? Okay, that's what we've learned. So like, like you've learned if you have x squared, that's a parabola. If you have negative x squared, well, it just goes upside down. Same concept behind that. Okay, it all depends on where that negative is. Okay? Okay, so mainly what we're going to do is look at transformations for a few minutes on an exponential function. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. And again, what I'm going to do here is, is just to show you how the arithmetic goes, and we'll talk about what we get. We're just going to use, again, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, like that. Okay? And I'm going to crunch these out one at a time. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do two rows here. I'm going to do um, this row here. We're just going to do y equals 2 to the x. And I'm going to do this real fast. I'm just taking... 2 to this power. So 2 to the 0 is 1, 2 to the 1st is 2, 2 to the 2nd is 4, 2 to the 3rd is 8. Then over here you would have like a half, a 4th, and an 8. We already did that. I already talked about that. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and do two graphs on this, on this thing because I want to show you what the transformation is. So let's go ahead and let's start by just doing the, the basic graph here that we have, okay? Like we have here, we're going to have 0, 1. You'll have 1, 2, 2, 4, and then 3, 8, and so forth. And just use like a dashed line to represent that elementary function like that. Okay, so that's the graph of y equals 2 to the x, okay? Now, let me see if you know this. What do you think would happen with that x plus 2? We've already learned it, really. We just haven't learned it in the context of this function. What's that? Moves to the left too, right, okay. So remember like if you had a parabola, like if you had x plus 2 to the second, remember that moves it to the left, doesn't it? Okay, because it's inside the function. 
this is also inside the exponent. So since it's inside, then what we're going to do is you know that that's going to move that to the left too. If you wanted to move it to the right too, what would you do? You would say x minus 2. Okay, it all it ends up being where it is in the problem, say it's inside. So actually all I'm going to have you do on this then is let's just move these points to the left too, then we got it. Okay, so I'm going to move this point to the left too, move this point to the left too, and so forth, okay? And then that will give us a good enough graph if you just move that like that. So I want you to know how the transformations work on that, okay? All right? If you're putting this in your calculator, if you have a more modern calculator, it'd be okay. If you have an older calculator, you would have to put 2 and then exponent x plus 2 in parentheses. But if you got an 84, generally it'll do that superscript for you anyway. The, the asymptote is still y equals 0 for now. Okay, so that's how that goes. Okay, all right, we're going to do another transformation with this. So we're just going to do kind of the same thing. Now you can bypass this thing if you want to here. I'm just going to have you go ahead and graph this again so you don't have to fill that table out again. But I do want you to go through and just sketch out that basic graph that we've been doing. So we're just going to go plot those basic points that are in that table. Let's do that again. Okay, so I usually just start with 0, 1, and then go 2, 1, uh, 2, 4, 3, 8, then we'll just kind of sketch that in like that. So that's the same basic elementary function we've been doing, okay? Okay, let me ask you guys, okay? What do you think that negative 3 does? <coughs> Doesn't reflect anything. Remember, what, it's, it, what you're doing is you're making all the y values get smaller by 3. Exactly, so you're going down for you might see it better if you wrote it this way, okay? So you have 2 to the x minus 3 like that. So remember if you had a parabola and the minus 3 was outside, then you know that that goes down 3. So it all depends on where it is. It's outside of the exponent, outside of the function, so it's making everything go down 3. Okay, we don't need to do a table of values on that. I just want you to take all those points and move it down 3. The other thing that would happen is where would your horizontal asymptote go? It would go down to y equals negative 3. So you do have a horizontal asymptote of y equals negative 3. So you want to put an asymptote like that. And then all the points just get moved down. Okay, so I'm just going to take everything down th 3. Just take maybe some of the points. That's going from 4 to 1. And if you get just a few of those points in there, that'll be what your rough graph looks like is like that. Okay? All right, so all, the, all these transformations work exactly the same thing on every single function you'll ever learn. If it's inside the function, it's tending to play with x. If it's outside, it's, it's changing y. So that's what I want you to try to get down, okay? Okay, let's take a look at this. Okay, I'll show you what happens on this one then. Okay, let's go ahead on this one, and let's go ahead and just build the table like this, okay? So... On this problem, we have a negative, but it all depends on where that negative is. So let's just do negative 3, negative 2, negative 0, 1, 2, and 3, and let's just crunch it out and see what happens. Okay, I'm going to start way over here. If I plug a 3 in, I would have 2 to the negative 3. Well, what's 2 to the negative 3? It's 1 over 2 to the third, so what is it? 1 eighth, right? Okay, so let's kind of see what happens here. If I go to this next one, if I do 2 to the negative 2, that's 1 over 2 squared, so that's a fourth. And once you do this, you're going to start seeing a pattern. 2 to the negative 1 is 1 half. 2 to the negative 0 is just 2 to the 0, so that's 1. So do you see what's happening? What's happening? Yeah, it's flipping this way, okay? I mean, these numbers are familiar to you. So what would happen here if you did the negative 1? You would have 2 to the negative negative 1. That would be 2 to the first, so that would be 2. Once you crunch one of, or two of them out, you'll see what happens. So the next one's going to be 4, and that's going to be 8. Okay? So what happens on this one, then, is everything reflects, but it reflects over the y-axis. Okay? And, that, and the reason it's doing that is because it's changing the x values to opposites. So it's going to reflect that way. So if you were to go through and then do your graph on this one, just plotting your points then you'll get a reflection over the y-axis. 
Okay, so I think I got that right. So I'll just put these points here. So let's see, I've got negative 3, 8, negative 2, 4, negative 1, 2, 0, 1, and then it just sort of goes like that. Still approaching the x-axis, you still have y equals 0 as your horizontal asymptote. Okay, so that's the idea. Does that make sense how that worked? Okay, all the x's changed to opposite. That's why the table just sort of reflected the way it did. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, so that's kind of your how your transformations work on a basic exponential. We're going to get into Euler's number, or E. Depending on your background, you probably studied that. I don't know how many people know where E comes from and how Euler came up with it. It's actually really interesting how he came up with it. Uh, he was working with economics. So Euler is, is one of the big top ten mathematicians of all time. And, and we name E after Euler. That's why we use E, because he's the person who discovered it. So what Euler did, and I'm going to take you through this a little bit on the next page, is he was playing around with compound interest. Back in the 1700s, people knew how compound interest worked, and they had banks and stuff like that. So he was just playing with an idea, and this is how he discovered E. So what I'm going to show you is, we're, is I'm going to show you how to use this compound interest formula and show you exactly what Euler did. What Euler did is he, he, he was just playing around like mathematicians do. He said, well, what happens if I invest $1 and compound over different time intervals? Okay, and $1 is big money in the 1700s, I think. So it was pretty typical to just work with an easy number. Now, what I'm going to do is on this next page, I'm going to take you through some of the calculations he did. We're not going to do all of these. We're just going to do some of these. And I mainly want you to maybe write down these numbers here, but you don't have to write this down here. I just want to show you what Euler did, okay? So here's what he did. He, he basically took the principal, which is $1, okay? And then he's saying, okay, I'm going to do compound interest one time per year. So if you're familiar with the compound interest formula, what he said is we're going to start with a dollar, we're going to be at 100% interest, and we're going to do this for one year. And here's what you come up with. So if you did put a dollar in the bank and it was 100% interest, after a year your money would double. What would happen is you'd have $1 there, 1 plus 1. Now see, if you have a percent, you move that decimal to the left to make 100% is 1. The over 1 it means that you're doing interest one time, so you have that. And then this NY, that's the, the number of years is one year, okay? And then this is, you do compound interest one time. So if you do that, you get a 2, okay? Now, you don't have to write out all these numbers. I just want to show you how the compound interest formula works. So what I'm doing on the next one is this. I have a dollar at 100% interest. Now, quarterly, what does quarterly mean? means you do interest four times, every quarter. Okay, so we do four then. Here we do uh, one year, but we do four times like that. Okay, if you crunch that out, you would get that number right there. Okay, so your money is now up to about $2.44. If you go to uh, yearly, there's a dollar, 100% interest, yearly is 12 times, right? So I do that, you do that calculation, now you're up to 2.61. You guys see what I'm doing okay? I went ahead and did this because I was curious about it. So if you do interest by the second, which you could, every, it turns out that that number, 31,536,000, is how many seconds are in a year. Okay, so I figured that out. And I put that in, same idea, $1, 100% interest. That's how many times I do interest. Now I'm up to $2.72, okay, like that. Now he was playing with this, and what we began to fi find here is, and I'll show you what he did to figure out E, so I'm going to take my calculator and just show you what this is. The, le the E constant, on a graphing calculator, E is above the division symbol. So if I clear off everything on here and just go second division symbol, and E will pop up. Well, that's what E is. See how this number is getting closer and closer to E each time you do that? So what's happening is E, usually for E, we use about 2.71 as an estimation. So if you look at what Euler did by getting up to the second, you're already pretty accurate to, to several decimals. Does that make any sense? Okay. Now this is what E is defined to be, and this is the compound interest formula. 
So I'm going to have you put this on your graphing outlet. I don't have the one there. The one dollar you can just omit. But that's one plus 100% interest over the compounding to the end power. Now what we're going to do here, like in calculus, you learn about limits. We're just seeing what happens as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, so I'm going to have you put this in your calculator. So go ahead and get your calculator out and let's put in this. And we're doing the compound interest formula on this. So it goes like this. Just put in parentheses, 1 plus 1 over x. Like that, close the parentheses, and then do that to the x power. So just put it in exactly like that. And then for a window, what I'm going to have you do is just something like this. Okay, let's start by just doing uh, a window like this. Let's go 0 to 100, because I want to take it out far enough to kind of show you what's happening. And then let's scale that by 10. And then for the y's, let's go 0. Let's go to 3. Why am I going to 3? Because I know it's going to go to E, and E's 2.7. Okay? So if you put that viewing window in, like that, and then do your graph, uh, then what you'll have is this. You'll have a curve that kind of is going up, but it's leveling off like that. Okay? So now, if you want to do this, if you go to Y, go to Y2 and put E in. So I'm going to go Y2, and I'm going to go second division symbol, to get the E to come out. And what happens is this. This is what I want you to see. Say so what happens is the horizontal asymptote of this function is E. Does that make sense? So the further out you go, he just sort of reasoned out. And remember, Euler, in the 1700s, calculus was at its beginning. So we kind of knew the idea of what limits were by then. So he reasoned out that that gives that the special constant. And we call it E in honor of Euler. Okay, that's where it comes from. Okay, did you guys know that? You probably knew a lot about E from your background if you took pre-calc in high school and stuff. But that's kind of what he did historically to figure that out. Okay, so the horizontal asymptotes Y equals E. That's what I want you to have. You don't have to write everything on there. But I want you to see just kind of how we went from 2 all the way to E. Okay, without writing all the details down. Everybody follow that okay? Okay. <coughs> So that's where the letter E, uh, the cons mathematical constant E, comes from. Okay, we're going to do um, a, a, a few graphs on here. Then we're mainly going to do a lot with transformations with this. Okay, This one right here we're going to do mostly with the assistance of our calculator. So uh, what we're going to do with this is just kind of start with these numbers, 0, 1, 2, Negative 1, negative 2, and that's good enough. Okay, now we're going to need to do this with our calculator because you're going to get decimals. So first of all, we're graphing e to the x, so e to the 0 is 1, so that's the first point. Then we do e to the first. Well, e to the first is about 2.7. Okay, that's about what that is. Okay, then we're going to do e to the second, and if you do e to the second, you can do that on your calculator. I think that's around 7... 0.4 or something like that. So I'm just going to go E raised to the second power and just round it to one decimal. So that's about 7.4. Okay. Now what happens over here if you do E to the negative 1? That's just 1 over E. Okay. That's just a fractional value that's going to get close to 0. And if you go here, E to the negative 2 is 1 over E squared. Now you don't need to change those to decimals. If you did, you'd have zero point something. That's the point. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so what we're going to do then is we're just going to plot these points. And the way that the graph of e to the x looks is going to be look like the way it did for 2 to the x almost. So I'm just going to plot these points. And that'll give us an exponential curve. So you have 0, 1, that's your y-intercept, over 2, up e. I'm going to have you write that as the point 2 e. And 0, 1. It's good to label these points. Then you go over 2, up around 7. So that would be 2, and that would be e squared. So your graph looks like that, and then it levels off like that. Okay, so the horizontal asymptote on that is y equals 0. Now, doesn't that look like y equals 2 to the x? It has the same shape, but it's a little steeper. That's the difference. Okay, when you study calculus, e to the x has a, is kind of a big deal when you're doing derivatives and stuff. So you'll learn about when, when you go over what the derivative of e to the x is, it's helpful to know what the graph looks like. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, 
Now, what I want to do is kind of summarize all of the transformations, and then we'll kind of finish this up by doing some of the transformations. Okay, this is an exponential function. This is the way this looks. Now, let's just write an example. Okay, let's say that you have f of x equals 2 times 3 to the, let's say, 4 x plus or minus, let's say, 2 plus or minus 7 or something like that. Okay, we're going to look at what all the transformations are. I'm going to start down here. Okay, what would that plus or minus 7 be? Up or down? That's up or down. It's outside. Anytime you're outside the function adding, that's up or down. Okay, so what you'd have is this would just be D is going to be up, down. This is stuff you already know. If it's plus D, you go up. If it's minus D, you go down. Okay, so that's how that goes. Okay, so in this particular example, okay, that's just the 7 is up, down. Okay? All right, what would this uh, 2 do? That's inside the exponent. That's the key. So what does it do? Left, right. Okay, you're inside the function, so it's affecting x. So what you would have c in here, or I'm sorry, hold on, I'm doing the wrong thing. I think I got an extra letter here. Tell you what, let's change that to e. I can't have two of the same letter. I didn't type that in right, so, so I've got that then. Okay, so let's do e. So e in this problem would be left or right. Okay, and the same things we know. If it's plus E, it goes to the left, and if it's minus E, it goes to the right. So you just got to know where that falls in an exponential function then. Okay, all right. Now what happens on this one is let's look at A, and you want to relate this to everything that you know. What if you had a parabola? What if you had X squared? You know that's a parabola. What happens if you put a 2 in front? What does it do to the parabola? Stretches it. Vertical stretch. It makes Y get bigger. Therefore, it stretches it. Well, the same thing happens on this. A is going to be a vertical stretch or shrink. Understand how it goes instead of memorize it. Just makes Y get bigger or smaller. Okay, so that's exponent. That's going to be vertical stretch or vertical shrink. They like that. Okay, how do you know if it's a stretch? A has to be bigger than one. How about a shrink? It has to be a fraction between 0 and 1 because it makes everything, the y's get smaller. That's the idea. Okay? Now, how about C? C actually does the opposite of that. Okay? So C, what that does is it does this way. See, that's inside. It's messing with x. You're multiplying that x by C, so it's affecting things this way. So we would say horizontal stretch or shrink. That's what that is. And everything's totally opposite on that. So it goes like this. So this would be a horizontal stretch or shrink, and everything is totally opposite on this. Okay, so that's the idea, all right? So uh, that's, that's how everything goes in that function. That's where all of the transformations exist in an exponential function. The other thing that we want to look at is what would happen if you made A negative? What would that be? reflect this way, because what it's doing is it's messing with y. Y's go the opposite, they go this way. How about if I make that opposite? We did that a minute ago. We did like 2 to the negative x. Right, that goes this way. It makes x go opposite. So what this is going to be is the negative a would just reflect over x in the x direction, so that would reflect over x, and then negative c, what that's going to do is that's going to reflect over y. Okay, so that's the idea, okay? So to help, one of the purposes of what we do with functions is if you take calculus, you study functions very much in depth, so you want to know functions good before you get there, how they work, how they change, and what they look like, okay? Okay, so what I want to do on this uh, last page here is just summarize these things and kind of put these together, okay? Then we'll start a little bit into logarithms tonight, probably just with the definition. Okay, what, is, what happens on this problem? Up, up two, right. Okay, e to the x is the exponential curve. How about number two? Good, down four, good. Okay, how about number three? Left three. Okay, it's inside the exponent, so that's left three. Number four? Right two, good. Okay. 
Number five, reflect over X. Okay, it's in front, so that's going to reflect over X. And if you say reflect, be sure you tell me what it reflects over. Okay, how about number six? Reflect over Y. If X becomes opposite, then you're going over the Y axis. Understand how that works. So that's going to be reflect over Y. Okay, how about number seven? What does that two do? Vertical stretch, right? Why is it stretch? Because that number's bigger than one. It's making the Y's get bigger, okay? So we're going to write on that. That's just a vertical stretch. Okay, how about number eight? Vertical shrink, right, okay? You're multiplying, you're making the Y's cut in half. So it flattens the graph out. So that's a vertical shrink, okay? Number nine, we got a bunch of stuff here, okay? What does the seven do? Up seven, okay? What does the X minus two do? Right two, good. Okay, what else we got? What does the one fourth do? Vertical shrink, good. Okay, so that's a vertical shrink. Okay, and then what does the negative do? Okay, reflect over X, right. Okay, so that's it. So you just got to know where all the numbers are and how they work. How they work. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, so that'll kind of give you a, a summary of um, 